Information in Conversation. Proudly brought to you by AFGRI, Fort Knox, Hinterland, Monsanto, Nedbank, NWK and Sendus. Good farmers who take seriously their duties as stewards of creation and of their land's inheritors contribute to the welfare of society in more ways than society usually acknowledges or even knows. These farmers produce valuable goods, of course, but they also conserve soil. They conserve water. They conserve wildlife. They conserve open space. They conserve scenery. Good day and welcome to Nation in Conversation with me, Theo Foster. Today's discussion is about energy, with specific focus on alternative energy. You can follow us on Twitter at Nation Converse or visit the website nationinconversation.co.za. Joining me in the studio today is Charles Sienekal, owner of Sienekal Farming, and Mark Bosov, Head Strategic Initiatives at NetBank Business Banking. Good day, gentlemen. Hello. Good day, Charles. You are a large-scale sugar farmer. Energy costs have risen dramatically in the last number of years, and it seems that that is going to continue in the future. From a farming perspective, how do you approach these hikes in energy costs? Theo, it is a fact that energy will only escalate in value. It's becoming more scarce. You can't have any growth in your business or even your country without sufficient energy. And Seneca Farming decided to do research. And we, we decided to build our own power plant on the farm uh, at a cost of over a billion rand uh, to generate between 16 and a half and 18 megawatts of electricity using green tops and trash that we would normally burn on the farm. We, sugarcane is the only crop in the world that you grow for a year and just before you reap it, you set it alight. So uh, that fire is now, we want to use it, that, that, that material, we want to use it in our power station. But just as important as, as, as generating power is conserv conserving or using power optimally. There, there's also space in that side of the equation. Huge, huge. Uh, over the last five years, a lot of technology improved on pumps and electricity. And uh, some of the pumps running on farms are running at 75% efficiency. And today you can buy pumps running at 94% efficiency and electric motors at 95% efficiency compared to electric motors of 88% efficient. So any pump, any motor, older than 10 years, get rid of it as soon as you can and install the latest technology using VSD drives that will give you optimum use of your, your energy. And that alone will also reduce not only your energy cost, but your usage of energy and more efficient usage. Exactly. As, as you said earlier, it is just as important to generate it as it is to work with it sparingly. And uh, it's highly important that farmers investigate it, talk to ESCOM, talk to their advisors. They're pretty clued up and they will tell them what to use or what not to use. And it's they can run to the internet. It's on there every day. So every pump, electric pump that's older than 10 years, get rid of it. And then look at other sources of energy. From your point of view, Mark, clearly if one were to enter that field, it is like any other business. It requires research. It requires capital. It requires a model that actually works. Let's start on the research side. Um, where would one start the process of looking at alternative energy? Theo, we find that a lot of our clients um, have either started that process themselves and 
through the normal channels, I think we all do it, um, Google, have a look what's out there and that. But we're finding word of mouth is also a, a very big way of um, spreading the, the good news of green energy. And you'll find somebody will come and visit um, Shoal's farm, see this thing and say, well, what's happening? How do you do it? And it gets going on that basis. If you not in that space where you don't want to look at it yourself in that. There are many um, engineers um, and energy audits out there, or auditors rather, out there, that um, will come and do an energy audit on your premises, in your commercial building, and that they first start with measuring, they then have a look at how they can um, reduce your costs, your, your tariffs, um, they look at how they can reduce your energy consumption, changing light bulbs, um, moving things into more optimal places, and then what the renewable um, solution is on the the, the the further side and it's a very good way to go through it is to have a look at how can you reduce your cost um, how do you reduce your consumption because the end result is that you need less um, pumps or turbines or solar panels which reduces your cost and then when you come to the financing house um, and they look at it it becomes far more affordable what will the finance house typically look at the finance house typically looks at your, yourself as a, as a client um, it's, it's like any um, lending that would be done by a bank or finance house. We'd have a look at the, the, your ability to repay. But that ability to repay is enhanced by the savings of your um, electricity uh, or your, the electricity that you're generating. So what you would save on your electricity bill because the sun is now producing the electricity, we would use to say, well, you've got more or better ability to, to repay. We will then have a look at um, the term because I think most people understand that this kind of um, technology has a longer payback period. So you can't do it over the traditional three years or five years. We do it over a longer period um, and assist the client on that basis. So there's a whole lot of things that we would look at, um, structuring, we look at the cash flow, um, and of course the cash flow is enhanced by the government incentives, the tax incentives, the ESCOM incentives, all of those kinds of things add in to make this thing really viable from a financial point of view. Sure. Your experience in terms of, of the planning phase and supplying energy into the grid, what was your experience in that respect? Because one here, the, that ESCOM is an unwilling partner. What's your experience? Uh, they, they treated us very well. Uh, I think uh, one of our partners is an, a qualified electrical engineer. He did all the, the necessary documentation. We uh, put our tender in, and within a matter of three weeks, they replied positively. I think it's the way you prepare the documents they must be able to read it. They must be able to understand it. They must be sure that you're not trying to put a, 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 a bad quality generator on your, on your system, for instance. Use the best technology, and then they'll allow you to join in. So it's more on your side where you need to do your homework and come with a proper proposal. Then you actually find them receptive. Exactly, Theo. Your experience, Mark, in terms of the grid, municipalities, your own electricity? We picking up a bit of a mixed bag. Um, some municipalities um, are far more advanced in, in this process and are far more willing to have a look at it, to assist you to put um, energy back into the grid. Other, um, and make it viable, obviously. Um, it, it would depend on how much they're going to pay you to um, receive the electricity. Other municipalities are less advanced on this, this stage and it just is not viable. And that's why we often say to our clients, have a look at what you need and put in enough to, to generate the, that quantity at this stage. And when things do change, you can always add on. That's the beauty of solar or any renewable energy. It's like a big Lego block. You can just keep adding on to what you need. Uh, where it makes sense is where, where, where the municipality buys electricity at the same price as it distributes electricity. Am I correct in that assumption? If we could do it at the same price, it would be wonderful, but generally it's at a slightly lower price. But it's that differential that's causing the problems with the um, viability of actually generating electricity and putting it back into the grid. So we're finding a lot of people generate their own electricity and might even use it for um, farm workers, the people um, living around the farms and those kinds of things. And that even that makes sense purely because you're self-sufficient. After the break, I'd like to look at some trends that we're seeing internationally as well as locally. Stay tuned. You're watching Nation in Conversation. Welcome back to Nation in Conversation. Shaul, you've done research in Scandinavia, in Europe, and the 
amount of electricity being generated, even on small scale, larger scale, is quite different than what we used to in South Africa. Uh, if you look at what's happening in the rest of the world, specifically pertaining to farm and the generation of electricity, how does it differ from us? The Danish people identified this crisis many years before us, and that's why they're world leaders today. It, 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 it flew over to other Scandinavian countries where they're generating electricity on large scale using 20 and 25 megawatt plants. And I don't want to estimate, but it could pro probably be 40% of the country's electricity is generated by, by private entrepreneurs. South Africa came in a bit late, but fortunately we have the, the, the Scandinavian setting the example, making the equipment available to us. So I think, as I said earlier on, there's a serious revolution in South Africa to produce more quality electricity that will go into the grid. What would your advice be to, to, to farmers specifically? You have the experience, you did the research. What's your advice in terms of generating their own electricity? Not everybody farms on our scale, so I would propose that groups of farmers come together, 10, 15, 20 guys, and, and uh, put up their own plant, uh, supplemented by using solar energy, because in the sugar, in the, uh, uh, sugar uh, farming business, we have a lot of uh, sunshine, and that must be used. And as every day goes by, new technology comes out. The solar panel has more than, than, than uh, dropped 50% in price since, since it came out a few years back. So it's becoming more and more viable. And uh, it is the route for the future. It's clean energy. We don't pollute anything. We, it's a friendly energy. You know, the, 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 the nature is a, a hanging judge. You hurt him, he hurts you. And, uh, and that's the way forward. We must, we must be friendly to nature. So use nature's resources to enhance our businesses. Mark, if you look at the current state of affairs in South Africa, the demand, the financing, the, 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 the projects, uh, how would you describe that? At the outset, it, it, um, there was a lot of interest generated. Um, people were thinking um, that this would be the way to go in that. Unfortunately, the economy is a little tough at the moment. It's, um, it's a, quite a decision for a business to decide, I'm going to put up a million rand or a million rand plus on my roof to generate electricity for something that I'm actually already paying for and I should be receiving without prices going up beyond CPIX, without it being cut off or whatever the case is. But we're seeing as time goes by, um, the uh, savings that you can make just generally, and then also the price reductions and the b various financial institutions bringing out products that work on such a way that you almost get a cash flow neutrality. We're seeing that there's more and more people starting to step up to it. Also, it's changing. In the beginning, it was, I would put up solar panels on my business for my use. But we're seeing more and more people are saying, this is not my, sp my business speciality. It's not um, where I want to concentrate. I'd rather go to an independent power producer that is producing electricity and buy it from them and substitute my, my charge from ESCOM to, to the power producer. So we're starting to look at models to de um, develop that kind of um, thing as well. So it's, it's almost getting a life of its own and um, moving quite rapidly. But we're foreseeing that it's going to become an entirely new industry um, where your suppliers, your um, engineers, your consultants, all those guys become an entirely new um, industry in South Africa, and I think it's going to boom. If you look at the industry at this point in time, we talked about solar, the other elements in that industry? The other elements are slowly gaining um, a popularity. It's, um, I think solar is the easy one to do. You take some panels, and I don't want to simplify it, I'm, I'm just a, a financier, but you take panels, um, you generate the sunlight, or well, the sunlight generates electricity, put it into a PV system, you might even put it into batteries or, or whatever the case is. So that's the easy one to do, and it's, it's rel readily, or readily accessible to everybody. Turbines, wind turbines, those kinds of things, you either need to be in a very windy area or have a big space, those things are huge. So it's starting to develop, but we're seeing more and more it's becoming for independent power producers rather than a person putting a big windmill on his property or whatever the case is. Biodigesters, as Charles is alluding to, um, gaining in popularity. And um, it's, it's a great way to uh, get rid of the waste and maintain that green um, chain that we're trying to um, maintain. 
in your case, your project has not only benefits to yourself, to power generation, but it's structured in a way that there's benefits to the community overall. As a spin-off, <clears throat> I have four communities farming around me. Uh, and as a spin-off, we offered them a two and a half million rand a year donation for the next 20 years. And uh, some of the tribes have almost zero income. So a two and a half million uh, donation to every tribe would have been a, a nice cash injection to the people. And that's based around the viability and, and, the, uh, and, and the commercial viability of the project on your farm. Exactly. Will you be able to supply electricity to the community as a whole? We are, we are putting it straight into the grid for ESCOM to, 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 to distribute. There's a huge demand for electricity in the tribe because they also want to start sugar farming. They also want to irrigate and that kind of electricity is not available at this stage. And it will cost ESCOM billions of rand to supply that quantity of electricity to our area. So they're very anxious for us to proceed with our project. We talked, Mark, Charles talked earlier about the fact that some scale might not be big enough, that, that there should be almost groupings or cooperatives or structures where there's various scales, where there's various people uh, involved in the process. Now, we have examples where that work in terms of specific water, the old water boards. If I look at the generation of, of power and I look at the fact that it might have scale benefits if there's more than one grouping together, from a financier point of view, how would you approach a project of that nature? Those projects, um, typically sit in our, um, our corporate um, space because they, they're very large. Um, in business banking, we look at smaller companies than that. But um, the typical approach would be is to see what, what the um, feasibility is of the, the, the project, um, who the people backing it, um, involved in it, can one rely on them? Um, because one of your risks is, of course, um, that it doesn't produce what it says it's going to produce or it doesn't come online quick enough or whatever the case may be. So there's a whole um, exercise that goes through it, feasibility studies, cash flows, all those kinds of things. And then to find a, um, a, a, a suitable backer that you could um, have a look at and say, we're willing to um, put the money in there and we know that we're going to get our returns. So at the end of the day, the bank wants their money back, um, but we also want to make sure that um, energy is produced clean and um, for, for the um, entire community. And this is, we're developing a new industry. We are developing a new industry. After the break, I'd like to look at the future, I want to throw a few ideas around as to where we're going and what the end result would be in terms of energy, in terms of the, the generation capacity, as well as what, what the elements will be that will play a role. You are watching Nation in Conversation. We'll be back right after the break. Welcome back to Nation in Conversation. Mark, we've talked about the fact that this is an opportunity. ESCOM's tariffs is going to continue going up. That means this opportunity from a cost perspective will become more and more viable. Yes. If you look forward three, five years into the future, or even five to ten years into the future, and you look at the projects that we're busy with now, you look at the potential of these projects, how do you see these developments and what are we moving towards? I think we're moving towards um, independent power producers that would um, produce enough energy for a uh, say a, a factory um, a, a complex or a, a, a place where um, you, you have a suburb or something to that effect, almost standalone utilities. I think that's where we're going. Um, we're seeing um, Charles starting to talk in the same direction, um, that looking at these communities and those kinds of um, enterprises. And I think it's going to become more and more viable. And I think ESCOM is most probably um, going to become far more participative in this and actually encourage it. Because I think it's becoming very clear in the economy in that, that if you don't give power to the people, the people don't have power. And you can interpret that any way you want. We cannot grow the economy unless we have power that's it's available, it's cheap, it's clean, and it's, it's something that we all can take almost for granted. With, and we've seen the elements that, that our economy and there's various economists have made various calculations that what we have lost in the process because of energy and, and how much bigger the cake would have been. Some economists put it that the, the economy today would have been 10% bigger. If you just add all the elements out, now a 10% bigger cake makes a massive difference. Charles, 
if you look to the future, if you look five, ten years to the future, you've had the experience of, of, of looking at these plants, of cutting costs. How would a farming operation differ now from five or ten years in the future pertaining to resources, energy, uses of energy, generation capacity? Uh, those elements play a very key part in a successful farming business. Guys that are not looking at, at, at generating their own electricity on a farm will be knocked by, by ESCOM because they are not going to get CPI um, price increases in the future. They'll get 10, 15, well, they're asking for 25, I believe. Yeah. Uh, so the sooner they get going, even if it's on a small scale, I think it is imperative that we start looking at and that they talk to advisors and uh, there's a serious amount of research going on. While we're asleep at night, research all over the world are working on it, 24 hours a day, to give us a better future on energy. Are we slowly privatizing the generation of energy? Well, certainly the, the, the will is there. It's a very expensive process, but as technology grows, it'll become relatively cheaper. And I had a farmer's day uh, just more than a year ago on my farm. And uh, we expected 100 people to arrive and 187 people arrived to talk about this. And of the 187, at least 70% have already addressed some of their energy needs by using more effective equipment to pump their water, starting to put in solar panels. Uh, one of our houses belongs to my son, Andre. He actually did it himself is currently exporting from his house electricity into the grid free of charge because he runs four or five air conditioners in the house. Um, he's got two geysers, everything driven by solar power. This crisis we're having now, there's an old saying that you shouldn't waste a good crisis. <laughs> is this actually going to lead South Africa to be more energy sufficient in terms of their own needs, but also to broaden the base of energy? I believe so. Um, I've quite recently had a discussion with the IDC where they're looking at putting together a program that creates solar panels, um, manufactures them, and get um, smaller enterprises involved so that we can grow a micro-industry, get it um, on, on its feet and move it forward. And just from that, you're then going to need people who install, you're going to need people who finance, you're going to need people who uh, maintain. So I think this, this is going to um, grow beyond our expectations. And I also think it's going to get to a point where we most probably can start exporting some of our energy rather than being a net in importer of um, energy. You've looked at some of the countries surrounding us in the rest of Africa. This is not only a South African problem, it's a bigger problem and there is also bigger solutions. Yes, they, they, they have huge potential in Africa to do so, uh, solar as well as, uh, as uh, um, water from dams, you know, hydropower. Uh, a country like Zambia uh, is normally totally independent, but with a low water in the rivers at the moment because of the severe drought, they're also battling. But they're addressing it. They're building more dams. They are going to utilize every stream in Zambia that falls that drops lower, uh, more than 20 meters, will get a little turbine in, and that will supply uh, electricity to a community, and, and, and that's the way forward for us. But we have a great friend, and that's technology, working with us day and night to, to improve it. And uh, if they go to, to uh, uh, sea current energy, uh, I think uh, we will be, the whole world will benefit from it. So it might be a crisis today, but this crisis is going to lead to more green energy yes. produced by the people that use the energy. And in the end, we will have a better solution than we had. Absolutely. And hopefully it will also lift the plight of our farmers who are struggling with drought and all those things because of the um, carbon uh, footprint. Thank you very much. I certainly enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. You can join us on Twitter at Nation Converse or visit the website nationinconversation.co.za. From me, Theo Foster, good day. Nation in Conversation, proudly brought to you by AFCO, Fort Knox, Interland, Monsanto, Nedbank, NWK, and Sendes. 
The world is changing today. The world is changing in every way. Let's stand together. Put our hands together. Join hands forever. We're making it better. No matter where you are, you could be near or far away. We're seeing.